Now, one of my favorite authors, Susan Jacoby. Uh, she's written the new book, The Age of American Unreason. Uh, she was, of course, a writer for the Washington Post earlier in her career. And uh, her last book was Free Thinkers, A History of American Secularism. Susan, uh, welcome back to the Young Turks. Oh, I'm so happy to be on Young Turks. So many reviews has, have said I have a senior citizen mentality. I'm eager to be on a show that is not only for senior citizens. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. Well, you found the right place. Uh, Susan, let me start by asking you this. Was there an age of reason in America? <laughs> well, I, I think there have been ages when reason was more valued, certainly at, certainly at the founding of our country. And also, it's not really the point, one of the points I make in my book is I'm not harking back to a golden age with my, quote, senior citizen mentality. What I'm saying is, given that the hum of, sum of human knowledge has advanced, we ought to advance, have advanced ourselves, and we haven't. Mm -hmm. And how do you do? You think that we have not advanced, or have we regressed in in, in some ways in reasoning and, and rational thought? Well, I think we've regressed. Uh, I think we've definitely regressed in the last thirty to forty years. Uh, partly as a result of the 24-7 infotainment culture and the fact that we have the attention span of a gnat. And I'd like to make a point, because your, your latest horrible news item from Iraq that you were reading before my interview brings it up. Uh, I happen to watch, have watched a lot of the hearings with General Petraeus yesterday, and they were really fascinating and awful. I really think that, that the questions that were asked yesterday were more important than anything since the Watergate hearings. And you didn't even get a sense of it in the newspapers today because all they did was talk about the questions the presidential candidates posed when some of the best questions were asked by people like Virginia Senator Jim Webb. And I was thinking about the difference between this and Watergate. You can bet that hardly anybody watched those hearings yesterday. They weren't, of course, carried by the networks. There were no long digests of them carried at night. And if you were alive at the time of the Watergate hearings, 34, three years ago, you know that the country, which was working just as hard, it was glued to those hearings. Uh, if we had had the same laziness in our attitudes toward evidence and our same short attention span that we do today, Richard Nixon would never have left the White House. You know, I, I think there's a lot of truth to what you're saying there, because... Uh, it's become accepted that we need to only entertain on television or in other forms of media. And so if it's not a form of entertainment, Jim Webb is asking good questions. Or today we covered Representative Adam Smith uh, asked a great question about uh, Iraq and Iran and our relationship with the Iraqi government and Iran's relationship with the Iraqi government. He really got to the heart of the matter. There's no prayer of a chance that that'll make television or radio or any other show other than this one, honestly. Absolutely, absolutely not. And that is because people are not willing to sit down and pay attention for a few hours to anything. Yeah, it, it does seem that way. And it seemed like we were at least more engaged and cared more about the news uh, back in, in, in the Watergate time. And, and it's certainly when you draw that analogy and, and, and you look at that, you think, well, we have regressed in some ways, I suppose. And it, the media is certainly not as much of a watchdog. But, Susan, on the other hand, uh, we've made great strides in medical technology and science, uh, certainly our, with our you know uh, research into DNA, et cetera. So, how do you how do you look at that and and say that we are overall still regressing? Because this is actually you've just asked me the perfect question. Yes, we have, and that is what's so awful about the level of pub public ignorance about science. We have made great strides in things like DNA research. And guess what? Two-thirds of the American public, according to surveys by the National Science Foundation over the last 20 years, doesn't know what DNA is. Now, how can you have an intelligent public discussion of all of the issues at the nexus of science and ethics when people don't even know the basic scientific facts? Are 15-year-olds, in, in the when they're tested along with de other developed nations of Europe and Asia, are smack dab in the middle on science, which is to say mediocre, and at the bottom in math. Uh, there, that's what I'm saying in my book, is this, there's this huge gap between the sum of advanced knowledge and the knowledge of the American public about it. And, and this inevitably will lead us. We, we're, all, we're all being told all the time, still, we're number one. Well, it's not true anymore in a lot of industries. And I believe that, that that is, you know, eventually 
Americans are going to wake up and smell the coffee about this, but will it be too late? That's the question. So what, let's get to the core of the problem, Susan, because one of them is this, you know, infotainment uh, culture, you say. Although I think that if you do it right, infotainment can can bring information in an entertaining way. It, it can go the right way or it could go the wrong way. Unfortunately, most of the time it's gone the wrong way so far in the U.S. Uh, but are there other forces at play here that is that are pushing us away from reason, rationality, and logic? Well, sure, but a lot of them are related to the infotainment culture. Uh, one of them is the decline of reading. Uh, only half of Americans under 44 read a single book last year. And, and by the way, I'm not saying, you know, I agree with you. There's plenty, for instance, in, in the digital world on the web that's great stuff. But the question is really how we use this. And I think one of the problems is, is that when, when I hear people talk about the web as though it's some kind of a god, it's not. It's a tool, and we can use it for good or for ill. And we're using it for ill when we're spending seven hours a day watching, you know, playing video games or watching TV. And all of these things are increasingly indistinguishable, by the way. There are hundreds of cable channels, too. Uh, in, in an ironic way, all of these choices have enabled people, if they want to, just to look at the things that... that that they already agree with. I mean, one of the features of our culture today that's so anti-intellectual and anti-rational is the unwillingness to give a hearing to other points of view. I know, talking on Air America, but most of the audience already agrees with me. Just as if you're listening to Rosh Limbaugh, most of the people who listen to him already agree with him. And I'm not, by the way, I'm not comparing you to Rosh Limbaugh in terms of rationality. But we live in a culture where people only take what they want and usually what they're seeking is not any kind of intellectual challenge they're not exercising their minds but they're seeking validation of what they already believe but susan isn't that the problem i mean when we look at this rationally uh, as of course you uh, are arguing we should isn't the problem not the media companies as much as it is the people because that's what they're asking for i couldn't agree more i i get really annoyed when when People ask me questions about 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 the corporate world, as though the corporate world is forcing us to spend seven hours a day in front of the TV. The main thing I wanted to do with this book was start a cultural conversation about how we spend our time, and by the way, how we encourage kids to spend their time. I'm really encouraged by the fact that I've gotten thousands of emails from young parents of young children in the last six weeks since this book was published, because it suggests to me somewhat to my surprise, that there are a lot of people who really do care about this. And one thing that's happened in the last, just since I've been writing this book, is the push to extend video and TV, not just to toddlers, but to babies, for every infant to have a TV screen over their crib. And, and I should say, by the way, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with plunking a three-year-old in front of the video for an hour so you can have an adult conversation and a drink at the end of the day. Who hasn't done that? What I am saying is when that hour bleeds into two and three and four and five and you plop yourself in front of the TV all, all evening and don't read to your child, put a TV screen over their crib, uh, you're the problem. But you know, nobody is, nobody is, is dragging us by the hair and making us spend hours and hours a day in front of passive infotainment. We're talking to Susan Jacoby. She's the author of The Age of American Unreason. And, and Susan, you know, you write about history often, and obviously you've studied it. And when I look at history, I see it as a steady progression, but not one that is constant. I, it ebbs and flows, but I feel the chart goes up nonetheless as it ebbs and flows, right? Uh, so do you get a sense that this is a, an ebb and that we will find our way back to uh, peaking again and uh, moving forward into a new age of reason? I would like to think that, but I don't. I think unless we become very heavily aware, I think, I think that the addition of, think about it, we take it for granted, but it's so new. This is the first era in human history in which we've been able to plug our ears into noise and have our video before our eyes 24 hours a day if we want to. It's portable. And if you ride the buses in New York City, you know a lot of people do choose to do just that. I am afraid, unless we get some kind of a shock, something comparable to what Sputnik was in 1957, oh, how could the awful Soviets have beaten us to, into space? Unless we get some kind of a sort of crude shock like that, 
I don't know what's going to happen, but I don't think it's cyclical because I think that the that the 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 media culture has really is really changing the way people learn everything. And I would like to think that it's only cyclical, but honestly, I don't unless we take ourselves in hand. That's interesting. Let me ask you one other question about uh, that somewhat relates to your previous book, which was uh, largely about the founders. Uh, you think if uh, the f I know this is a bit of an absurd question, but let's have fun. Let's try to see if you know if you, <laughs> you have a sense of it. Uh, if the founders were to see America today, you know Thomas Jefferson, etc. Uh, a, you know, what would they think of their creation and their invention? Uh, would they be surprised by? It? Of course, they'd be surprised to some degree, no question about it. But and B, how do you think that they would try to steer us back in the right direction? Yeah, that that is a really interesting question. It's it's the kind of historical speculation I love. I wouldn't say, of course, they would have been amazed at the technology we have today, but but actually, the founders were people who thought about the future. I I, I think, in fact, if you could have explained computers to John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, it probably it probably wouldn't wouldn't have been so hard. I think the thing that they would be most horrified at is the decline of reading. I don't think they would see any reason why the existence of these other things should have made people stop reading. And I think, I think probably this is just such total speculation. You know, what do I really know what Thomas Jefferson and John Adams would have thought of all of this? But I think what they would have said, since it was certainly was their emphasis when they were alive at a time when only a small percentage of people could read, is that we're using these tools wrongly. That instead of using them to further free inquiry, in a way we're using them to close down our minds. Where uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, who was not of the founding generation, but but later on, said the mind of a country taught to eat, taught to aim at low objects, eats upon itself. And I think that once Adams and Jefferson and Franklin, especially, could would have got got the hang of computers. Then they would have looked at they would have looked at the world of, of knowledge on computers and and how much time we spend watching people throw up on YouTube as opposed to the world of knowledge, and they would have said, well, you're not using these great tools you've invented rightly. So, Susan, you've seen two girls in a cup too. Pardon me. <laughs> oh yeah, I have. As a, as a matter of fact. Okay, that's what I thought. <laughs> I, I had to I had to look at YouTube for my book. <laughs> Well, there you go. I mean, you're a scholar. You're looking it up. You're finding out what's happening in the uh, culture today. And, you know, I'm, uh, and I'll end on another scholar, uh, George W. Bush, who said, yes. you know, <laughs> it's my job as the president to keep expectations low. <laughs> and I get the sense that he kind of set the tone. And it's not a hard tone. job either. Well, in his case, absolutely not. But I feel like he set the tone for the rest of the country. Just like you said, uh, the Ralph Waldo Emerson quote, he well, I d no, I, I don't agree with that. I think George Bush is the product of who we are. I don't think he's set the tone for the country. I think he reflects the tone. I think it reflects on us, and I don't mean you and me specifically, but the American people elected George Bush. They chose to elect a president, the president they would rather have a beer with than the other candidate. Well, we see the results of it. I deeply believe that we get the kind of government we deserve, and I think it's a real cop-out. It's like politicians who say to people, you were lied to. I was lied to about the war in Iraq. The fundamental question ought to be why we've become so stupid that we're so receptive to those lies. Right, and why we didn't find it out on our own, too. Why, why we've allowed, because there were, plenty, there, were, there were plenty of warning signs and plenty of people who were sounding the bell, and people chose not to listen. Susan, I'll end by making this comment, which is that, you know, I, I always found that to be very troublesome, and this is where I would blame the media, that they set the standard as the guy who you want to have a beer with, which, by the way, it's a curious decision to, if you did want to have a beer with someone, to have it with an uh, alcoholic like George Bush. That you would imagine that would cause an enormous mess for him and for everybody else if you did have that beer with him. But uh, I, I think we need, that's the one place where we need to insist to the media, you know, this time we have to pick the smartest guy. We have to pick the guy who is not the average guy, but someone who's better than us, who can you know, provide real leadership. Now, whether that gets through the media, we'll find out hopefully in about you know, six months or so. But uh, I yeah, think it seems like it seems like it's already been going on for years. It does, it does. But we're getting there. We're getting there. Uh, but I, I hope and I believe that your book uh, is going to contribute positively to the conversation. Susan Jacoby, thanks so much for being on the Young Turks with us. Thank you very much.